listening to United and Resilient, a podcast designed to help heal and support the El Paso community. Hello, I'm your host, Mariana Sierra, Outreach Coordinator for the El Paso United Family Resiliency Center, a program of United Way of El Paso County. We are dedicated to serve those who were impacted directly or indirectly by August 3rd. Join us on the journey to long-term recovery as we have honest conversations with local leaders, mental health specialists, and fellow El Pasoans who share their stories and expertise. We feature topics that influence and impact the vitality and resilience of our community. We are El Paso United, and together we heal. Juntos sanamos. Dear listener, before we begin, a note of warning. The topic we're about to explore contains a mention of the mass casualty event and a description of the events that unfolded thereafter. This episode may not be suitable for everyone. Hello everyone, welcome back to United and Resilient. At the FRC, we recognize that providing care to others during a tragedy like August 3rd can lead to stress, anxiety, fear, and other emotions. Coping with these emotions can affect the well-being of our first responders, the care they give to others while on field, and the well-being of the loved ones outside of work. During this episode, we'll talk to one of our wonderful community partners, Dr. Débora Ontiveros, founder of West Texas Responders Alliance. And throughout our conversation, we'll talk about the importance of mental health for our first responder community some of the current stigmas, and what can we do as a community, family, and friends to help them cope with the signs of stress. Dr. Antiveros, thank you so much for being here with us today. We're very excited to have you at United and Resilient. Welcome. Thank you so much, Mariana. I'm so excited to be a part of this. And we're excited to have you, like I said previously to you, I think this topic in particular is so important. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your expertise, and what is it that you do? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Deborah Antiveros. I'm actually a native El Pasoan. I'm from El Paso. Um, I've been practicing as a mental health clinician here for about 25 years. My specialty originally was employee assistance, which is working directly with organizations and providing counseling for employees, but also very involved in working with supervisors and leadership. One of my early contracts was with the El Paso County Sheriff's Department. So I've been working with first responders for over 20 years. And over the years, became more and more interested and more and more specialized in working with first responders. I'm also married to a responder. My husband just retired from 33 years in federal law enforcement. And Dr. Antiveros, I know uh, for the people who are listening, you also uh, take the lead in a, in a nonprofit organization called West Texas Responders Alliance. So can you tell us a little bit about what that is and what is it that you guys do for the community? The nonprofit was formed as an outgrowth of my involvement with the El Paso City County recovery effort after the August 3rd shooting in 2019. I was asked to chair one of the work groups that was responsible for the responder community and getting involved in that and starting to understand the process and and really taking in everything that happened in the aftermath of that event. um, It seemed wise to start a nonprofit that would be able to carry on some outreach work and bring multiple agencies together uh, across the El Paso community, but also the West Texas region. So that's really where the initial startup ideas came from. We've been in existence a little over a year now, and we've um, identified 
three primary initiatives or, or outreach themes that we're developing. And so we've been very active putting those together and getting everything in place to have a good infrastructure for the nonprofit. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And West Texas Responders Alliance is one of our uh, community partners, actually, at the FRC. And we're so lucky to have them because, of course, as part of the FRC, we believe that first responders is also part of uh, the people that we want to reach out to and we want to be there for them and help them in any way they need. Um, so, Dr. Antiveros, now I want to get into mental health for first responders. So, first of all, I want to ask this very basic question. Who is a first responder? Well, and yes, thank you to the FRC because you have been our first community partner and it's just been tremendous working with you and with the United Way. Under the recovery model, first responders are a fairly large group of professionals, which was a little bit of a surprise to me as I was learning about it. The work group that I chaired was responsible for law enforcement, uh, local police and sheriff, but it involves much more than that. So also all of the communications specialists, the EMS personnel that responded, the state level, for example, state troopers who had a presence at the event, um, medical responders, both hospitals and other agencies that were unfortunately caught up in the tragedy. So that would include the FBI, the medical examiner's office, um, a very wide uh mixed group of professionals. So in my mind now, when I think of responders, I really think of all of those communities and all of those agencies and specialties as the responders in our community. Awesome. Thank you so much. Because yes, when I when I first started, I, I thought of a first responder as a policeman or a firefighter or a nurse, doctor, but I, as I went through, I noticed that it was a rather large group and it was so important um, to also address mental health in first responders. So um, why do you believe it's important for first responders to take care of their mental health? Well, how a responder is doing mentally and emotionally really is the bedrock of their performance and their ability to go out day after day and do the job, stay focused on what they need to do, be able to respond quickly, um, and also to be able to respond compassionately and empathically to the things that they encounter on the job. Um, physical health is obviously important as well, but it's all tied together. There's really no way to tease those things apart. Right. And I love what you said about compassion and empathy, right? Um, because in my preparation for this interview, I was, you know, trying to get as much as information and talking to friends who are also first responders. And one of the things that really sticked out to me is that sometimes as as you get used to the to the job, you go numb. You uh -huh. see tragedy, uh Every, on an everyday basis. So sometimes you go numb into what people are going through. Like, so I think it's very important what you just said that also build that compassion for first responders as well. And I've seen it increase. Um, I don't know if you agree with me, but you know, whenever I go into social media or have a conversation with a friend, I've seen an increase on the importance of taking of one's mental health. I see more of my friends who are also first responders, you know, going to therapy. Um, and do you see the same increase within first responders and their leadership as well? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, there's a lot of really exciting things going on across the nation and, and also in other countries where we are really coming to appreciate the importance of caring for responders and their families and how they're doing mentally and emotionally. Some of this is beginning to become very formalized. So, for example, at the federal level, 
there was legislation passed in 2017 um, and that has trickled down to the state level. There are several work groups at the state level that are starting to look at um, first responders, mental health and wellness needs. There's a lot of very exciting uh, work groups um, across the nation that are doing really cutting edge work and also reaching across to other professionals, other specialties, uh, other agencies to, to bring all those pieces together. Um, on a personal level, you know, working so closely with responders and their leadership, I have to say that absolutely, when you speak to these professionals one-on-one, -on -one, you really do come to appreciate how much they care about each other and they care about each other's well-being and supporting each other and paying attention to how things are going. There are still some issues obviously in, in the culture and, and um, that can still create hurdles, but there really is in my mind, a huge shift over the last 20 years to really paying attention, but also bringing resources to these issues, which may not have been as true in the past. Right. And I, I do see that as well, that, um, you know, even we're trying to implement more mental health care and in insurance even. So I think that's wonderful. But is there also still stigmas that surround mental health for first responders? Um, you know, like I said, I talk to to my friends who are also first responders and they have this idea that they always have to be strong and that they always have to be part of this support system. So what are some of the common stigmas or fears that first responders um, go through? So, yes, it's true. I think that there, there is still stigma. There's a fine line that responders have to walk. They do need to have resilience and they do need to have skills that they develop to be able to cope on the job. And sometimes it's tricky for responders or for their supervisors to know, you know, when has something, you know, tipped into being unhealthy or being counterproductive. The word stigma itself is used so frequently in these kinds of conversations that it, it almost self-perpetuates, right? So you hear that word over and over again, and then I think as an individual responder, you you take that in and you think, oh, well, you know, everybody else believes in these barriers, and so they may or may not be there, but it causes hesitancy. Um, Having said that, you know, responders sometimes do have to step away from the job if they've been through a critical incident or they've had enough cumulative stress. And there's some genuine concern on how that's perceived by their coworkers and how that might affect them professionally. So it's not wise to ignore that because the reality is you know, that when responders speak up occasionally, you know, that that can cause some concern for their agency. And those are not easy issues. Right. One of the things that I was reading about is sometimes that there's this fear even for first responders when they want to speak up and they want to, you know, have this conversation with their supervisor or their leader, um, and they're afraid of losing their jobs even because maybe leadership believes that, you know, they're they're not okay to be doing their so maybe they're they're dealing with something, but they're afraid of speaking up because they also want to take care of their family and, you know, being that provider. Um, so what are your thoughts about that? Like, how can a first responder who maybe is dealing with, you know, uh, mental health and they're struggling with their mental health, how can they have this conversation with this conversation with leadership or their supervisor without the fear? Or what is it that we can do for, you know, 
leadership to be more open to these conversations? Yeah, so I think there's really two things that are important. One is educating leadership and supervisors on how to have those conversations and how to respond to those conversations, be open to um, also sharing their own experiences with their team on, you know, bumps in the road that they've been through in the past or difficulties that they've had and how they have overcome those. But you can never within the organization completely get away from, you know, whether or not the responder um, should be out in the field at any, you know, critical time. So it's also very important as a community to provide a whole network of supports and services where responders do also have options that they can speak to somebody, doesn't even have to necessarily be a mental health professional. It could be a chaplain, it could be somebody who is trained as a peer, it could be a really good friend who's trustworthy. Um, It can be a national hotline, and there are a number of those hotlines that are confidential and anonymous. And so you just want to make sure that responders understand that working through their issues or working through whatever stress they may be having doesn't always involve going through that organizational channel and and letting them know they have options. And it also doesn't always mean being labeled, you know, a mental health client. That's not always the case. Right. And also taking care of one's mental health, just like, you know, doing little steps for first responders to always have, you know, an outlet and that community support that you're talking about, because maybe they're uh, holding a lot of stuff in. And then, you know, there comes a point where like everyone else, you know, they're going to, you know, (laughs) with everything. So it's very important to provide those resources that way every single day they are taking care of their mental health as well. Yes. Yes. And that's a huge part of the conversation um, in the first responder community is this idea of ongoing cumulative wellness and building resiliency. Resiliency is built the same way that you build a muscle. You know, you, you do healthy things and you engage in healthy activities and relationships every day, every day, over and over again. Um, and you, you build that capacity over time. It's very difficult to do that after a crisis or after a critical incident if you haven't already been putting those things and those practices into place beforehand. It's not impossible, but it's much more difficult. So yes, ongoing daily practices and an attitude that this is part not only of being healthy mentally and emotionally, but it's a critical job skill. And responders, I think, understand that. You know, they go out on the range and they practice because they know when I need to uh, know what to do, I need to have practiced. And they physically will practice. They'll get fit because they know when the moment comes, I need to be able to run and, and do things quickly. But the same is also true mentally. You have to practice ahead of time and build that capacity before the time comes. I really love that definition, Dr. Antiveros. I've been asking and questioning myself, how do you build resilience? And I love that you said it's a muscle that you train every, every, every day. And I love that. Thank you so much for sharing for us, putting it in such a simple way, but it, it encompasses a lot. So thank you. I also read about the importance of, you know, for mental health providers to understand the first responder culture. Can you expand a little bit on this thought? Well, first responders are highly specialized in their professions, and those workplaces do have very distinct cultures, similar to, you know, the distinct culture of the military. 
So as a clinician or a peer or a chaplain, it is very important to be familiar with the culture, especially because responders can be hesitant to reach out and trust somebody to talk to them. If you accidentally uh, say something, even very well intentioned, you can really cause a responder to shut down. And then it's harder later to get them to try again. So becoming familiar with responder culture and also having, I think, a natural interest in it. You know, people who love responders love responders and it's, it's a niche and it's uh, exciting and there's a certain rapport there. That would be true in any mental health specialty and developing that over time so that not only do you feel comfortable in certain situations and certain conversations with responders, but vice versa, that they, they realize that you get them and you kind of know what the job entails and, and the unique features of what they deal with all the time. That takes time to develop that expertise. This is United and Resilient. We'll be right back. My name is Eric Pearson, and I uh, work for the El Paso Community Foundation, uh, and, which I've, I've done for the last 14 years. And August 3rd was a day like no other. Um, the foundation does a film festival every year, and we were I was on my way to the Plaza Theater to meet Sam Elliott and uh, you know, just talk with him in the green room. And on the radio was uh, the news that there was a live shooter situation. And so that morning uh, I got to the Plaza Theater. I told Doug Pullen, who manages the film festival and Catherine Berg, who happened to be backstage with the Elliott family. And uh, we said, you know, they were having a family reunion uh, in the green room. And I pulled them aside and we said, we need to get a fund going. And within 20 minutes we had the fund you know, up and running, and I had spent the rest of that day, you know, just talking to people, and uh, and 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 you know, our role in in a lot of ways is to tell people that it's going to be okay. And um, having dealt with uh, emergency response in my you know career, uh, whether it's uh, as a news director dealing with you know what happened on September 11th, 2001, uh, running a newsroom and reporting on that to the world, or whether it was uh, dealing with Mexican earthquakes the prior year. Um, we had some experience doing this, and so we called all of the government officials, uh, local, county, state, federal and told them what we were doing. I called my friends at CNN, said what we were doing. The fund was posted and within about 24 hours, we received about 6,000 individual gifts. And uh, when it was all said and done, us and the Paso Norte Foundation created one fund, El Paso. So uh, we decided, you know, we needed to do something that was unified. And so we created one fund, El Paso, and and collectively raised about $12 million for the victims of this fund. Uh, and we continue to, you know, do scholarships for children and grandchildren and fund the Family Resiliency Center in a way that, that helps it, you know, provide services to people and the aftermath of the shooting. The lesson I learned from all of that was that, you know, I do well in crisis situations and I don't do well after them. And uh, it wasn't for several days that I started to really, you know, just lose my mind. And uh, there were a lot of tears, uh, a lot of uh, we had staff meetings and just a lot of emotion that was raw out there. And, and the beauty of it was that our community came together in such a beautiful way. Um, really, uh, I, I, I can't say enough how wonderful that was to see. And I think this pandemic has been far worse than all of that because, you know, you have a, an earthquake and it's over, you have this shooter and it's over and everyone moves on and tries to heal. And now we're in the midst of a pandemic where we've been doing this same sort of work for 
months and will you know probably be doing the same sort of work for years and in some ways that shooting was easier to deal with once I got my head around it but it but it was hard and and the idea that someone would come in and steal El Paso's innocence was rough. Um, El Paso and Juarez had been in the, the, the spotlight of, you know, federal governments from Mexico City and from Washington, D.C. for the, my, my entire life growing up on the border. And um, they've never gotten our story right. And um, to see that manifest itself in murder was the worst possible outcome. And it was manifested from the same ignorance that has emanated from, you know, the capital cities of both of our countries for a long time. And uh, I hope that from this, we can come back and be able to tell our story in a more meaningful way, own our story, and let people know that we are a wonderful community of people on both sides of one border. And now, Dr. Antiveros, I want to get into, I think, a very important part of this conversation. And as you mentioned in the beginning, you are a wife of a first responder. Your husband is a first responder. So I think also like family members and loved ones are impacted uh, by this. So I want to uh, take a moment and talk a little bit about family members and loved ones and how can family members, um, you know, be impacted by what their loved ones are facing on a daily basis and what are the resources provided for them? Well, you're definitely impacted by what happens on the job. I know that early in my marriage, my husband lost a coworker on a case that that they were working together, his partner was actually shot and killed in the line of duty. And I was much younger at the time. Um, it was a little overwhelming watching him go through that and, and just attending the services and hearing him talk about what had happened. Um, and and over the years working with family members and and how hard the job can be on the family system sometimes you know responders work odd hours and they work a lot of overtime and and sometimes family is good at acting as a sounding board but not everybody is cut out for that and that's fine but if you're not cut out for that that's okay, but how do you encourage your responder to have those supports and who can they talk to when they need to get something off their chest? Families though, I think sometimes are operating behind the scenes and it's so important to reach out to them very deliberately and very specifically. Let them know they're a part of the team and they will have their own stresses and that they they also are included in that sense of community and outreach kids as well it's very difficult on children sometimes um we've had situations over the years where children you know heard on the media something that their parent was involved in or heard about it from classmates. And, and it's easy to forget or lose sight of the little ones. Um, it's a little harder to connect with them, but it is so important. And vice versa, when a family is going through a hard time, that's gonna impact the responder and their focus and their abilities on the job as well. Right. And now that you mention it, I'm interested to know uh, for anyone listening and, you know, they can relate to what you're saying that sometimes it's difficult to, you know, explain to a little one, you know, and they're, they're singing it on TV or they're talking it with their friends. What would you say to those parents and what resource can they provide to their children? That way they're making sure that um, the little ones are also being taken care of. Well, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I think 
setting the example of being healthy and open communication, creating within the home an environment where it's okay to talk about things, it's okay to ask questions. And most parents really do have good instincts in that sense and are are mindful to do that. But also getting information into the home of what the resources are and where the networks are as well so that intimate partners and children know that they can also reach out, that they're certainly going to be impacted by being a part of this professional community. Um, I would like to see a lot more happening with children. I know that as that's part of what our nonprofit is really focused on, is how do we also specifically reach out to um, spouses and children and make sure that they have their own activities and supports and and rapport with each other because it's so crucial to to have that now my next question um dr ontiveros would be you know what happens i'm just thinking about the situation when say you're married to a first responder you're married to a nurse to a policeman, to a fighter, fighter, and you see that they're struggling with their mental health, or you see your parent who's struggling with their mental health and they're, you know, um, showing symptoms of stress. How can you start a conversation of, hey, I'm worried about you. Um, can Do you want to seek out help? Do you want to talk to a professional without being triggering and without being invasive? What would you say to those family members? Well, I think you put it perfectly. I think what you say is, hey, I'm worried about you. And maybe give a couple of examples. You don't seem to be sleeping well or you're a little grouchy. Um, it It's not necessary to tiptoe around that too much. But, um, you know, be gentle, be straightforward. And, and then say, you know, it's okay if you don't want to talk to me, let's find somebody that you can talk to. And don't necessarily expect a positive reaction right away, but you've planted some seeds. And I've had many responders over the years say, supervisors have done this, or their spouse has done this, just said, hey, I'm a little concerned about you, and they didn't want to hear it in the moment, but they chew on that and they kind of think about that and later may respond to that. So don't be afraid to speak up. Don't expect an immediate response, um, but keep an open mind. And, and also that attitude of it's okay, you're not a robot. I don't expect you to be a robot. And if we need to do something, we'll, we'll do something. I'm here for you. Right. And now, um, you know, one of the things that I also read, and I think it was brilliant and, and really important, um, I read about how it's also very important for family members to have the knowledge and skills to support their loved ones and for, you know, resources. And you, like you said in the beginning, you know, this network of support to provide that knowledge. So are there anything, um, are there any resources like that provided for or family members where they can get education? There are. Many agencies have internally programs where they bring family members in, they do educational events with them. It's not always consistent. It depends, you know, on funding and spouses have to also have time in their schedule to get involved in those things. Luckily, because of the internet, there are many groups on the internet that are very active that family members can get plugged into. But also, it's helpful if family assumes a little responsibility and says, well, let me be a part of this as well. Let me get a little skin in the game and get involved and reach out even one-on-one -on -one to other family members that they know or meet along the way or something a little more formal. 
uh, of a group or, or a peer related activity. So there's a wide variety of things, yes, that can happen. It depends on the agency and the resources and also spouses um, buying into those things and getting involved with them. Right. Thank you. Well, we encourage everyone to to reach out and ask for those resources, um, because I know it, it always helps to have that community uh, and your support system. Right. And like you said, I, I love that idea of, you know, being able to talk to someone, even a friend who who is in a similar situation as you. Now, I want to get a little bit back into what we were talking about, about the stigmas and the fears that surround mental health first responders. And as we mentioned in this podcast before, and we mentioned in our social media and all our different outreach outlets, um, the FRC is a big fan of non-traditional therapy. We believe that um, we recognize that there are some stigmas in our community, and we believe that non-traditional therapy can ease those stigmas. So, you know, why do you think non-traditional therapy is important for, for first responders and how can non-traditional therapy ease those stigmas that maybe first responders are facing? Going back to what we were talking about, um, the stigma that's associated with traditional mental health approaches, that can create a barrier. And there are other ways to relieve stress. There are other ways to connect with community. There are other ways to deal with trauma. And so non-traditional therapies can be very helpful in that sense because they're not lumped together directly with um, mental health or talking to a counselor. And yet you can achieve much of the same thing. You know, you begin to think about your health and think about what's going on in your body and interact with other people who are interested in those same things. And there's a very natural outgrowth in that before or after a class, for example, you may share a conversation with another responder or even with just somebody else in class and find that connection that you need, find that encouragement, find that support or provide it for somebody else. Also, you know, our bodies are um, a network. Everything affects everything else. And so if we're stressed or we're dealing with painful emotions, oftentimes we are going to be holding that somewhere in our body. The classic thing is, you know, tight shoulders and neck and I've got a tension headache and things like that. And so you can start to work on what's going on in the body. And a side benefit of that is going to be some emotional improvement. So it doesn't always take a full on, you know, let's get you into therapy approach, right? Yeah. Right. And like you said, right now, you know, it's, it's like building a muscle. So those non-traditional therapies can help that build that muscle. And, yes. and, you know, it's, it's little steps. It's the little steps. So now Dr. Antiveros, I would like to head to our close uh, call to action and closing statements of the interview. First being, if someone is listening out there and they want to learn more about, you know, your nonprofit of West Texas Responders Alliance, uh, what are the next steps to take or what would you say to those first responders or family members of first responders who are listening? What are the next steps to take if they have seen uh, signs of, you know, stress? What would you say to, to those community members? Well, they can certainly reach out to us directly. Um, our website is still under development, but our contact information is on there. We're calling it Texans to the rescue.com. And you can read a little bit about some of our initiatives. And that's one way to get a hold of us. You can reach us directly at our office. That number is 915 593 5676. You can certainly reach us through the FRC. 
Um, you've been a great partner in helping us connect with the responder community. And keep in mind that in reaching out to our office or to our nonprofit, we're also going to recommend other resources. I, I have no hesitation doing that. So if somebody doesn't feel like they want to come in for counseling, well, we're going to recommend a lot of other things. We're going to recommend yoga, or we're going to recommend uh, reading material, or we're going to recommend even a chaplain or one of the national uh, organizations that, that just have so many resources. So it's just taking that first step and checking out the information. Thank you so much, Dr. Antibido. So there you have it. If you're interested in learning more about um, what is it that this organization do and how it can help you, please reach out either to the FRC or as Dr. Antiveros mentioned, directly to them. And now Dr. Antiveros, I wanna ask you my favorite question. Um, what is it a message of hope that you would like to give to our community? I believe that in community, in relationship with other people, we are really at our best. And that is also how we heal. It's so important to maintain those relationships. If there's a silver lining to COVID, it's that we've had to slow down a little bit. We are hopefully a little bit more connected with our families because we're spending a little bit more time with them, but also those people who are immediately around us. Also, um, and this is kind of going back to the previous question, we are, um, in the month of February, we're starting a nine-week marriage course for responders. That is a specific curriculum called marriage, uh, dynamic marriage. We're also starting a very specific outreach for spouses and intimate partners. And right now focusing on law enforcement and fire spouses. So we have both of those things um, starting up in early February. We're really, I'm really excited about that. We've been working on it for a while. Perfect. Well, there you have it. Those resources are provided out there uh, for for family members. And I think it's so important because it's a team. It's a team effort, right? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Antiveros, thank you so much for, for being here with us. It was a pleasure having you. Um, thank you so much for everything that you do for our first responder community. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very excited about um, things that are happening in the community and just supporting our responders. They're, they're so important to our daily lives. And thank you so much to the Family Resiliency Center and, and just the encouragement and support that you have been providing. It's been phenomenal. Thank you so much for listening today. We hope this content serves you and your loved ones as well. If you enjoyed our podcast, please do not forget to subscribe and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at El Paso United FRC. To learn more about our commitment to the community's long-term recovery, please join us on the next episode. Thank you.